spirit would give us wisdom, uh, and that your spirit would also afflict us so that we actually put into practice the wisdom that we learn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so our first um, uh, lecture is going to be from Aaron Ventura, Pastor Aaron Ventura, who is uh, the pastor here at Christ Covenant Church. So I'll open it up to you, Aaron. Well, it's good to see you all. Why don't I pray one more time, and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for giving us Christ. We thank you for giving us your word, and we thank you for giving us, as parents, the awesome responsibility of raising godly offspring as you give us wisdom as you give us tender hearts as we consider what your word has to say about education for we ask this in jesus name and amen amen in 1716 uh, jonathan edwards began his studies at yale college in connecticut he was 13 years old at the time and he already knew four languages. English was his native tongue. At six years old, he learned Latin, and by age 12, he knew both Greek and Hebrew. Jonathan was one of 11 children. He had 10 sisters, and he was homeschooled by his father, Timothy, who was a pastor, and his mother, Esther, who was a pastor's daughter. This was Christian education in the colonial era. As exceptional as Jonathan Edwards was, he would go on to become the third president of Princeton and one of the most important theologians of his time. His education was not altogether exceptional. It was common for schoolboys to be taught Latin and Greek and to engage with the classics in their original tongues. Knowing these languages was in many cases a prerequisite for entering university. In early America, there was a special emphasis placed upon learning to read so that people could read the scriptures. Children would memorize the Westminster Shorter Catechism and learn the basic doctrines of Christianity. What we now call the Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Brown, etc., were once explicitly Christian institutions. We might call them seminaries. They existed first and foremost to train pastors, to train ministers, and only secondarily to train civil servants. It was Puritans who founded Harvard, Congregationalists who founded Yale, and Presbyterians who founded Princeton. The university was a distinctly Christian institution that had a rigorous and religious quality that is basically non-existent today. Where once schoolboys learned Latin and Greek and entered the university in their early teens, today, how do young men arrive at college? Usually enslaved to pornography and addicted to their smartphones. Half of the adults in our nation read at the level of a sixth grader, and one-fifth of adults are illiterate. The U.S. continues to fall behind other nations in science and math and reading. And the real scandal is that we live in the most economically prosperous nation in the history of the world. And yet, we have become a decadent, depraved, and depressed society. The Bible says that God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And this is just the most recent fruit of American public education. And that's just talking about the academic side. Where schools once existed to teach wisdom and virtue in accord with God's word, today, government schools are full of godless immorality. They look more like prisons than houses for learning. Public schools have become inherently anti-Christian. And therefore, in the truest sense, they have become anti-human. It says in Colossians 1 that Christ is before all things, and in him all things consist. It says in Colossians 2.3 that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then in the next verse, Paul gives the reason for saying this. He says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Many Christians have been beguiled. They have been deceived by the spirit of the age. They have been taught that education is a neutral pursuit, that mathematics and science and English and history can be studied objectively 
without any reference to the God of history or the Christ who enters it. Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so I ask you, is the fear of the Lord reigning in government schools? Are the books and authors and teachers and topics they are studying sanctified by the word of God in prayer? Or are these schools full of people who know not God, what scripture calls fools, and who lead the souls of many to destruction? I wish I was exaggerating how bad the government schools are, but you guys, a lot of you, you know this. This is the sad state of public education in America, and it has degraded a lot even since I was in school. Uh, so this evening, I have uh, what I think is a very modest goal, and I might be preaching to the choir here, but I simply want to demonstrate from the scriptures the following thesis, and that is that Christian parents are required by God to give their children a Christian education. Christian parents are required by God to give their children a Christian education. That is my thesis, and I'm going to give you three uh, proofs or three reasons for this from uh, the Bible. However, uh, before we go there, I want to give you my own uh, personal history with education, just so you have a little perspective of where I am coming from. Um, I was not classically educated in any sense of the word. Uh, but my parents, who were relatively new Christians at the time, gave me what I would probably call a uh, fundamentalist Christian education. So I was taught that the Bible was the word of God. It's true, it's authoritative, and therefore things like evolution are just a lie. My parents listened to uh, Christian radio programs like Focus on the Family. I don't know if this, has anyone heard of Focus on the Family? You guys remember? Okay, so yeah. Uh, Adventures in Odyssey, that's kind of what I grew up listening to. Uh, yeah. um, and so as far as I'm reconstructing, you know, from, from years ago, uh, my parents listened to this, and I think that influenced them to homeschool me and my two sister, sisters. And eventually we joined a Christian homeschool co-op, and I attended that until uh, the ninth grade. There was no Latin, there was no Greek, or no, no Hebrew, uh, but there was all kind of the normal standard subjects. And the things that my mom couldn't teach, she found other people to do. So I had uh, outstanding English and science teachers through this co-op, and th there was a great socializing structure for me as well. Now, uh, because this co-op only went up through eighth grade, um, when I, when I entered the high school years, I transitioned into the public school system. And I did so alongside a handful of other uh, Christian parents and friends that we knew from this uh, co-op. Um, and if you think about this, back in those days, so this is uh, 2004 to 2008, so not that long ago. Um, but, but back then, uh, gay marriage wasn't a thing. <laughs> okay. Um, woke hadn't happened. They weren't grooming uh, children in schools. Uh, some of my teachers were even open, outright professing Christians. And the, uh, the education at this school was uh, academically very rigorous. So this was like, you know, top 2% uh, high school in the nation kind of thing. So it's a very good school in that regard. So uh, for all my problems with public education today, I personally had, had a very good learning experience there. However, I, I have to add a caveat. At the same time, I was getting a, a pretty solid education. This was also when I fell into the most sin. I mean, you're going through puberty, so there's, there's lots of reasons, uh, lots of temptations for a young man at that age. Uh, but I remember going to a school dance, and it was basically like an orgy with clothes on. And then after the dance, people go off and get into more trouble. And so for me as a teenager, uh, with parents that were uh, now in the process of getting divorced, those temptations and those opportunities to sin became... Uh, more numerous and irresistible. And so despite getting uh, straight A's and college credits and getting into the university of my choice, I arrived at college spiritually broken, with a gaping hole in my heart and burdened with guilt and shame. I had a crisis of faith that took years to work through. Now, I tell you all of this because in the Bible... Education is a lot more than just picking a school or a curriculum. 
In the Bible, education includes the things that happen outside of school hours. And so when I say that Christian parents are required by God to give their children a Christian education, I am talking about the whole of life, from morning until evening, from Sabbath to Sabbath. God is going to hold us accountable for what our children are taught and exposed to and how we disciple them through that exposure to the world. So that's a bit of my background, but let us turn now to consider uh, Holy Scripture. So I'm going to set forth Three biblical reasons for why Christian children need a Christian education. And uh, if you have one of the handouts, it includes some of the texts, uh, the biblical texts in it, if you would like to follow along. So reason number one, why Christian children need a Christian education. Uh, Number one, because the fundamental purpose for marriage is the raising of godly offspring. The fundamental purpose for marriage is the raising of godly offspring. Uh, The first command given to Adam and Eve after they were married was to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. When Cain killed Abel, that was a failure of parenting. That was a failure to obey this command. It is disobedient to God's purpose for marriage to raise children who murder your other children. And this is made even more explicit in Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. And there, uh, the prophet Malachi is addressing uh, unfaithful husbands. And this is what he says. He says, The Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. So notice the reason God wants faithful husbands and faithful wives is not just because adultery is bad or just because divorce is bad. Of course, those things are bad. But it's because he desires godly seed, godly children, faithful children to populate his kingdom. That is the fundamental purpose for which God gave us marriage. Not merely to have a lot of children, but to raise godly children. Children who will keep covenant with him. It says in 1 Corinthians 7.14 that the child of just one believing parent is holy. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. In other words, the children of believers are set apart from the world. In the eyes of God, they have a special obligation to keep covenant with him. And so if God regards our children as holy, so also must we. They belong not merely to us, but they belong to him. And therefore, they must be taught to love and obey him. That is the first purpose for marriage and the first purpose for having children at all. So that's reason number one. Children need a Christian education because God desires godly offspring from our marriage. Number two, second reason. Because God commands fathers to bring children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, this is the language of Ephesians 6.4, which says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This word for nurture here, uh, if you're an educator, you know it's this Greek word, paideia. And paideia is a loaded word. You you go back and you can read Plato on paideia. Uh, And it signifies discipline, instruction, training. In in modern English, we might call paideia uh, enculturation. And Paul says that fathers are to bring their children up in the enculturation, the paideia of God. This is not a new command that suddenly starts in the New Testament. This is the same standard that God has always had for his people. What we might call the uh, John 3.16 of the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Right? Every Hebrew boy would have known that verse for sure. And it continues, if you read Deuteronomy 6, it says in verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. 
and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So do your children know Deuteronomy inside and out? Do you? Because this is what paideia looks like. It is the self-consciously Christian enculturation that children are to receive. And Paul says that fathers, not mothers, fathers are responsible for making sure that this happens. Who else but parents can do this? Speaking and teaching God's word when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're on your commute, when you lie down and when you rise up. This is an all-encompassing paideia, all-encompassing thing that only parents can do. And so parents, but fathers especially, have this responsibility. In ancient Israel, the priests and Levites had a special role in providing teaching, similar to how our churches and Christian schools function. But ultimately, it is the father, as head of the household, who must choose how this enculturation happens and to make sure that it does. Some duties can be delegated, and some duties cannot. And we can you know, debate that amongst ourselves uh, later. Uh, but the bare minimum is that children are taught the word of God, and diligently instructed in the love of God, to love him with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and as Jesus said, to love their neighbor as themselves. This is the sine qua non of a Christian education. Without the word, and without diligent and constant instruction from it, there is not any Christian education happening. So this is the responsibility of fathers, and Ephesians 6.4 is about as you know, explicit as you can get. There's your proof text. Christian children need a Christian education. Ephesians 6.4 says so. All right. As if two witnesses was not enough, I'll give you a, a third. <laughs> third reason. Because Jesus says that a student will become like his teacher. In Luke 6.39-40, it says, And Jesus spake a parable unto them, saying, can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Uh, this is a universal principle, and it's really common sense. And yet millions of Christian parents continue to send their children away to be taught by unbelievers. Yes, we should plunder the Egyptians. Yes, all truth is God's truth. But the world must be filtered by wise Christian parents and Christian teachers. Christian teachers who know the pitfalls, who know the scriptures, who see the dangers, and have learned to distinguish not only between good and evil, but between good and greater good. That is the essence of wisdom. Read Proverbs, you just set things next to each other and say, which one is better? No man can give what he does not have. You cannot export what you do not produce. And so who are the people that are enculturating your children? Do you want your sons and daughters to grow up to be like them? Do you want them to grow up to be like you? That is the question you must ask when you consider a school or any education option or the curriculum you're going to use or the shows you're going to watch or the music you're going to listen to or the friends your children hang out with. They are always being formed. They're always being shaped by those who are teaching them. Education is discipleship. And discipleship is always personal. And therefore, the character, the quality, and the virtue of the teacher is the measure of a good education. So do you want your children to be like them? Because Jesus says, a student, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. All right, so there's your, your three witnesses for why Christian children need a Christian education, and I take that as a, a universal command for all Christian parents at all times. That's the simple thing, okay? Um, where the real challenge comes in is, uh, so how do you do this? Uh, and every family is going to have different obstacles and different challenges that they are going to need to factor in. For example, if you guys didn't know, boys and girls are very different, and they need very different things. Every child is different. And a wise parent must know their child and discern how to cut with the grain. They must know, you must know what they can handle and, and when. There are financial factors. There are time limitations. There are curriculum decisions if you homeschool or if you uh, enroll your kid at a Christian school. 
There are many questions that we need to wrestle with, but we must wrestle with them knowing what the final cause is. What is the final purpose of education? Well, it is godly offspring. To raise children into adults who genuinely love God, who genuinely want to serve him and have the ability to love their neighbor. I'll close with this. Uh, Psalm 127 says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. God did not tell us to raise a nice little boys and girls who never get into fights. He told us to raise weapons because we are the church militant. May God help us as we work towards that end. Let me pray. Father, we ask that you would bring a reformation to our country and to the way education is done, uh, even just amongst Christians. God, you know uh, far better than we the state of Christian households, the state of the church and its problems and infighting and disunity, and uh, you know the state of the many Christian schools and home schools that are out there. God, we ask for your mercy. We ask that you would be gracious to us. We ask that you would give us as a people a spirit of repentance to return to you and to obey your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.